She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's a coffee and crime time. Before we get started, I'd like to talk to you for a couple of minutes about our sponsor for this video, which is Big Fish Casino. You guys know how essential sponsors are to this channel. We talk about really important things and I'm so grateful to have a Big Fish Casino as a sponsor because not only does it help this channel continue to make the content that you guys love, but it's actually a game that I play and really enjoy. So I was very, very excited when they reached out to me. So enjoy this fun little commercial that I've made for you and I will see you in a couple minutes. I have a lot going on in my life between recording. What? Oh, come on. You go here. No, you go here. You go here. You go here. No, you go here. Oh, why won't you do it? And editing. Ugh. Why do you hate me? Why? What? What does that mean? Household chores like laundry. My gamma! My big gamma! Your bear gammas! My pastel and more laundry. Cleaning up after everybody else and finding everybody else's things. Mommy, where is my other sock? Mommy, where is my other sock? Mommy, where are my glasses? It gets to be a little much, and sometimes you just need a break. So at the end of the day, when the kids are in bed, and it's my time to relax, enter Big Fish Casino. Big Fish Casino is a unique game centered around the experience with your favorite slots. There are 70 different unique slot machines with different themes, and two more are added each month. A couple of my favorites are Goddess Grove and Tiger's Trove. I like a Goddess Grove because you get to pick your own goddess and it's really pretty and there's lots of nice music. I also love how social the game is. You can meet up with friends, you can create clubs with your friends, and you can compete with each other on the leaderboard and just generally when you're playing, you can chat with other people you're playing with. Generally in my everyday life, it's kind of stressful. I look into things every day and research things every day about murder and horrible things. So when I have some downtime, I really just like to do something fun and relaxing. And Big Fish Casino is just that for me. And as a special offer to my community, if you install and get started playing the game today, you'll get an extra 500,000 chips. That's what makes it so great. You already get 100,000 chips just for being a new player. But if you install from the link below in the description box, you'll receive an additional 500,000 chips, making it 600,000 chips for you to get started playing. Trust me, it's definitely enough chips to get you started and have you playing for a while. And if you do download the game and start playing, make sure you come find me at the slots. So thank you so much to Big Fish Casino and to the creators of Big Fish Casino, Big Fish Games. I have been loving 
the game. It has been so relaxing and decompressing for me. Thank you guys so much for watching, for listening to the sponsor, and let's get started. The way that I came across this topic for today's Coffee and Crime Time was a little different. I was actually going over my notes and getting ready to do an update video, a Coffee and Crime Time update, and as I was looking into the Timothy Pitson case, if you guys don't remember Timothy Pitson, he is still missing. But what ended up happening was his mother and his father were going through a divorce. There were some custody issues. She had some mental health issues. She took him on a trip, brought him to an amusement park, bought him some toys. Basically, they just had a couple days of fun together as mother and son. And then she was found in her hotel room. She had taken her own life. But Timothy was never found. And in a note, she said, he's safe. I've left him with people that I trust. But a lot of people speculate that she took her son's life as well, which then led me to other news articles that were linked to Timothy Pitson's news articles of parents who have killed their own children. And at first I was like, there's only gonna be a couple. This isn't a common thing, right? It can't be a common thing. It goes against nature, it goes against biology to take the life of a child you've given life to. But it was insane to me how many articles, and I just started going down a rabbit hole, finding one after the other after the other. And what was really upsetting to me was these articles and these incidences were all from the past year or two years. And I said, this is insane. This is a lot of mothers and fathers who have killed their own children in just the past year, just the past month, actually. There was so many news articles. And obviously I could never fit all of them in here, but I wanted to talk to you about a couple of them. And then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the implications of what we're seeing where you will hear people say, or you'll hear news articles say, filicide, which is the murder of a child by one of its parents, is very uncommon. But it doesn't seem to be that uncommon. In fact, I would argue that it seems to be on the rise. And there doesn't seem to be a clear line drawn as to what kind of demographic this kind of thing happens most commonly in. You'll find filicide in different socioeconomic statuses, different religions, different genders, different races, different countries, so different cultures as well. The ages of the parents who do this range from anywhere from very young, which you might expect, to older and the ages of the children would range from very young to what you might expect to older as well. It's just bananas and obviously it's more common in certain cultures. It's more common in certain countries, but there really is no culture or country or race or socioeconomic status that it is solely exclusive to. And that's kind of scary because you really can't pinpoint it. You really can't say this is going to be more prevalent happening in this area or within this race or within this religion. It's just seems to be something that humanity is struggling with. It's scary to me to think that it has almost become so common that we don't even get shocked anymore when we see it pop up in our news apps. Now there's obviously a disclaimer in this video. I'm not going to get graphic. I'm not gonna get into gritty details. I'm not gonna show you crime scene photos, but this is a video where I'm gonna go over a couple of cases that happened recently of parents who took their own children's lives. So it's upsetting to me as a parent. It's incredibly upsetting. I don't think you need to have children to have this really just break your heart. But if you're sensitive to crimes involving children, then maybe this video isn't for you. As always, I'm going to be as respectful and sensitive as possible. And I do really think that this is something important that needs to be talked about that really isn't talked about. Just as we spoke about it in the Rui Pedro video, how trafficking and human trafficking is completely swept under the rug, that it makes people so uncomfortable they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to think about it. This is another situation and scenario where people really don't want to think about it. They don't want to consider the possibility and it makes them uncomfortable. So I understand if it makes you uncomfortable and you have to switch off or fast forward through the parts that we're specifically talking about the cases, but I do encourage you to at least get to the end of the video where we talk about the implications and maybe what we as a society can do to try to at least minimize the amount of cases that we have to see when we read our newspaper every morning.
So I was a psychology major in college and one of the classes that was a prerequisite I had to take in order to get my degree was a child development class. And in this child development class, it was extremely interesting, number one. But number two, we had to read a book called A Child Called It. So this book was to me as you know a 19 year old college student incredibly disturbing and it's a very popular book i know that many of you have probably read it but it was very hard to read and i've never read it again i read it in college i have it in my bookshelf downstairs i've kept it i didn't get rid of it like i got rid of a lot of my other textbooks because i think it's it's an important read and i might want to pass it on to somebody someday to read but i cannot bring myself to read it again because it literally gave me nightmares. It disturbed me to the point where I, I couldn't function at times, where I was just so upset. And I, I obviously had a small child at that time. For those of you who don't know, my oldest daughter is gonna be turning 18 next month. So I was 17 when I gave birth to my first child. So I had a young child at the time when I was in college and I was reading A Child Called It and I was going through the topic of child abuse in our class. But even then, even hearing the statistics from the teacher and reading the book, it still seemed to me something that was just not common, that didn't happen often, that was abnormal. As an adult now, as somebody who regularly looks into cases of true crime, I know that's not true. I know it happens a lot more than any of us want to admit, but that, that book's always stayed with me. That book was based on a true story of a little boy who grew up to be a man and write about his experiences with his incredibly abusive mother. He's one of the lucky ones, right? He's one of the, the few who managed to escape that kind of very, very bad situation and have the presence of mind to go on and write about it in order to help other people who were struggling with similar issues. In that class, I became a mandated child abuse reporter. Most people who are healthcare providers or who work with children or families or who are going into the psychology field, they do become mandated child abuse reporters, which essentially means if you see something, say something. But when I was looking through these cases, a lot of them, that is what I thought about. You have your parents like Chris Watts who kills his kids because he wants to get out of his marriage and get out of his familial responsibilities because he wants to start a new life with somebody else and that happens. And then you have your parents who kill their children in what's called altruistic filicide. So they think that the world is so horrible and such a terrible place and they are personally depressed. They view their children as an extension of themselves. So they assume that their children too are feeling sadness and misery and depression and so they want to escape the world. So they take themselves out and they take their children out with them and they think that they're doing them a favor. This is something they do out of love and caring, not anger or, or hate. But then you also have your parents who abuse their children to such an incredibly unbelievable length that they lose their lives. And oftentimes you'll find that these parents aren't even charged with straight out murder. They're charged with involuntary manslaughter, something to suggest that their children died because of something they did involuntarily or they didn't mean for their children to die. They were just so abusive. Their children died as a result, which I, I personally don't believe in. I think if you've abused your child to the point where they die, that's murder and that's premeditated murder. In fact, because you probably have done this over the course of so many days or so many weeks, but that's just my opinion. And I'm obviously not a lawmaker or a politician or I would probably wanna change that. So let's get into some of these cases. The first case we're gonna talk about happened on August 21st of 2019. So literally just a couple of weeks ago. On August 21st, Marsha Edwards of Atlanta killed her two children, she shot them, and then she turned the gun on herself. Earlier that day, she posted a picture of herself and her two children, and her children were older. Christopher Jr. was 24 and Aaron was 20. So Marsha posted a picture of herself with her two grown children and put it on Instagram. And she captioned the picture, I've had the best summer, first with Chris in Miami and Aaron in Italy. I could not ask for better children. And that same day, later on, she, she killed them. She killed them both and then she killed herself. What the heck? is going on. Marsha was a surgical and medical equipment distributor for her own company. She was a successful businesswoman. She had been married to a prominent local surgeon. She was friends with the mayor. 
She'd recently visited her son Christopher in Miami for the National Association of Black Journalists Conference, and then she went on a trip to Italy with her daughter Erin. She took multiple pictures, happy pictures, in which she showed and shared to social media. Both Christopher and Erin were bright young people, headed down good paths, and now they're gone. But why? This wasn't some teen mom. This wasn't a woman addicted to drugs. These weren't little children. Not that I'm saying that drug addicts kill their children. Not that I'm saying teen moms kill their children. But when we think about a child dying at the hands of their parent, we think shaken baby syndrome. Or a young mother that is struggling with trying to be a mother but still live her life. We think about these things. That's why I'm saying that. Not because I'm saying every drug addict or every young mother will kill their child. Obviously, I was a young mother and I did not. So I don't believe that. So don't come for me, all the people who want to get mad about everything I say and try to cancel me. It's what we think about when we think about a child dying at the hands of a parent. This was a successful woman running a successful business who clearly loved her children and was incredibly proud of them. What the heck happened. Now this is still obviously developing, so we are going to keep an eye on this and hopefully the investigators find out something soon. I actually looked into this two days ago, so I'm going to quickly Google it and see if anything else has popped up. I mean, really no, nothing else has popped up. There's been other articles written about it, but they say much of the same. Every single person who knew Marsha and her children were completely stunned, beyond stunned. They could not understand how this could happen. They couldn't believe that she would do this. They said she was an amazing mother, that she loved her kids and was proud of her kids beyond belief. And the entire community that they were from is shocked and obviously just steeped in grief for the loss of these promising young lives. Christopher Jr. was a digital content manager for the Atlanta's Mayor Office of Film and Entertainment. Erin was a rising junior at Boston University and she just finished a summer internship with NBC in New York. I mean, these kids were going places and their mother knew it. This is obviously incredibly shocking to me. But what we have to understand is this is newly developing. So hopefully they find out more about why this happened, but let's move on. Heather Barron and her boyfriend, Kareem Levia, were recently indicted by a grand jury in the torture death of Heather's 10-year-old son, Anthony. Anthony died in August of 2018. Now, Heather had called the police and said that her son had fallen, but when the police investigated, they discovered that little Anthony, 10-year-old Anthony, had been tortured for up to five days prior to his death. Heather and her boyfriend poured hot sauce on his face and in his mouth repeatedly. They hit him with a belt and a cord, like an electrical cord. They held him upside down and dropped him on his head multiple times, and they encouraged other children who were living in the household to abuse and hurt him as well. Guys, Anthony was literally the most adorable little boy I have ever seen. Like, so sweet, such a cute smile, these beautiful, intelligent brown eyes, just adorable. So this happened in Los Angeles County, and even though I often think that California is a little bit liberal when it comes to life and death penalty cases, they are seeking the death penalty for Heather and her boyfriend for what they did to Anthony. Now, what's interesting to me about this case is you can see that it says earlier this month, relatives of the youngster announced a lawsuit against Los Angeles County, accusing the county and multiple social workers of failing to properly respond to reports of abuses of Anthony and his siblings. The Los Angeles Superior Court suit filed on behalf of Anthony's father, aunt, uncle, and six half siblings request damages in excess of 50 million. Anthony's aunt, Maria Barron, repeated the family's contention that the Department of Children and Family Services failed to protect her nephew, alleging that if social workers would have done their jobs when we called and told them what was going on, we wouldn't be here today. Apparently, Anthony had also been sexually abused in 2013 when his mother left him alone with a known pedophile. There was multiple calls from family members and friends, photographs and evidence of what was happening to Anthony and his siblings in that house and CPS did nothing. Obviously, that is what this lawsuit is saying and what the family of Anthony is saying. And I mean, I don't I don't disagree that that's the case, especially in some place like Los Angeles County, where you have a great number of people. There's a huge population there. There's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of crime. There's a lot of stuff going on that I don't think the Los Angeles County Social Services Department can probably keep up with, but when you have this much evidence, when you literally have family members who say that they've called and they've called and they've shown proof 
that these children are being neglected or abused and CPS does nothing, you have to then question whether these people do actually have a legitimate lawsuit. And I think they do, and I think they're gonna win. This past Thursday in Japan, a man called the police at 10.30 at night and said that his wife had just stabbed both of their daughters and then herself. The daughters did not survive. They were aged five and three, and the mother did survive, of course, and she is in stable condition. The police are waiting for her to wake up to see if she can answer the question as to why she would do this. Now, let me see if she's woken up because like I said, this was a couple of days ago. So this was three days ago that the article was printed. As far as I can see, there is no more information on whether she's woken up yet. I assume if she was in stable condition, she has woken up and the police have questioned her, but it will probably take a little while to get to the media. So obviously, like I said, this does not concern America alone or Japan alone. This is a worldwide epidemic. This happens in every culture, in every country, to every type of person. Four-year-old Malachi Lawson was reported missing from his grandmother's home in Baltimore this past July. Turns out Malachi was not missing at all. He was dead. And when the mother was questioned about it, she claimed that what happened was Malachi had soiled himself and gotten his clothes dirty. So she and her mother, his grandmother, put Malachi in the bath and then turned around, turned their backs on him, both of them, to wash his clothes in the sink because it takes two women to wash a toddler's clothes in the sink while the toddler is alone in the bath. And while they were turned around, he happened to have burned himself on the bath water from the waist down so badly that they said little pieces of his skin were floating in the water. Now, that's when they grabbed him out and wrapped him in a towel, but she didn't want to call any police or anybody because she didn't want the child to be taken away from her. She'd had past history with CPS and she didn't want to lose custody of her son, so she claims she put him to bed and everything was fine. But 10 days later, when she went to wake him up in the morning, he was unresponsive, she realized he was dead, so she put him in a garbage bag and called a lift and had the lift drive her to a dumpster where she threw her four-year-old son's body into the dumpster and then acted like nothing happened. Okay, the investigators did look into her story and found that that day that they said it had happened and most of the days following and before, the water temperature at that household had never reached that high of a temperature. In fact, it had never gotten over lukewarm. So there was no way that he had burned himself in the bathtub. This was purposeful. This was done most likely to punish him for soiling his clothes, I'm not really sure. But since she's had past issues with CPS, I can only assume that this was not the first time she's hurt her child. She and the grandmother were charged with 11 counts each, including child abuse, reckless abandonment, and involuntary manslaughter. Now, once again, if you ask me, this was no involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter, in my opinion, suggests that you died as a result of something I didn't mean to do but I truly believe that they meant to hurt him knowing that it could end his life. And that shouldn't be involuntary manslaughter. That's straight up murder. And not only that, but it's murder of a four-year-old innocent defenseless child who could not fight back or ask for help or help himself. So it's even worse than murder. Then you have Juan Rodriguez, and this is a case that I really don't know what to think about, but we'll get there. So Juan Rodriguez, he left his twins, his one-year-old twins, in his car all day while he went to a shift. He worked a shift at a hospital. He was actually a social worker. So that morning he left with his four-year-old and his one-year-old twins. He dropped his four-year-old off at daycare, and then he said he thought he dropped the twins off at daycare, but he didn't. So he just drove to work and parked and, and got out and went to work a shift. And when he got into the car after work, he saw that their bodies were still there. Obviously this was this past July, I believe, in New York City. It's, it's been a hot summer in New York. New York City gets especially hot. So those children were in the car the entire time in the middle of summer, probably for anywhere from six to eight hours, and, and they did not survive. Now a study shows that hundreds of children have lost their lives in a forgetful incident where the, the parent forgets the child in the car. 52 of them happened just this past year, and Juan Rodriguez claims that that is exactly what happened. He forgot that they were in the car. And there is talk about any charges being dropped against Juan because this was just a tragic 
accident, I would like to bring your attention to another case that reminded me of this case when I read about it. This case was from 2014, and it happened in Georgia. Justin Ross Harris left his 22-month-old son in his car while he worked an entire work shift and then claimed that he had done it accidentally, that he'd completely forgotten that he thought he dropped his son off at daycare that morning. Harris was sentenced to life in prison because it was discovered that most likely he did this on purpose while he sat in his office in the AC and his not even two year old son died in a hot car, Justin sent explicit messages to women and underage girls. It turned out that he really was just kind of wanting to live this bachelor life and wanting to be with as many women as possible and be a creeper online and having a child got in the way of that. So that begs the question, obviously, and I will put this question over to you. How can you tell the difference between when a parent is just genuinely forgetful tired, overworked, you know, has a lot going on. Twin one-year-olds are probably a lot of work and keep you up all night. 22-month-olds are a lot of work and can keep you up all night. But how can you tell when it's a forgetful accident or when it's being purposely done, especially when so many of these cases are just written off as accidents? Wouldn't that mean that if somebody wanted to kill their child, that they would figure this would be the best way to do it because you're more likely to get off and not get put in prison because you can just say, crap, I forgot, I thought I dropped my kid off at daycare. I'm in no way saying that Juan Rodriguez purposely killed his one-year-old twin. It's just an important question to ask, how can you tell the difference anymore when it's happening so often? and parents are tired and parents have a lot on their minds and they're trying to take care of kids and work. Drop the kids off at daycare, you've got more than one daycare stop to make, you know, is it possible that he just forgot they were in there? So like I said, I'm not saying Juan Rodriguez did this on purpose. I, I do think Justin Ross Harris did this on purpose, but I'm not saying Mr. Rodriguez did, but I think we need to look at these cases with a, a closer microscope when they happen instead of just having the court say, oh, that is very sad. You forgot your kid was in the car and you left him in there all day long and he died a very horrific death. It's not a good way to go. So we need to start looking at these cases a little bit closer and not just assume that because their parents or they're called good parents or people say they're good parents or they seem to be good parents or they're good parents to the other kids that this was an accident and, it, and there's no way it was purposeful. This one really bothers me guys. So this past June in Houston, a 26 year old woman struck and killed her three year old son with her Lincoln Navigator. She claimed it was an accident. She claimed that she was backing out and her son, whose name was Lord Renfro, he was behind her and she thought she ran over a speed bump and she didn't know it was him, she never saw him. But then surveillance footage from the apartment complex's parking lot where they were, that surfaced and we could all see this was no accident. So what it came down to was she was playing a game of chicken in this parking lot with her three kids. Lord, he was three, he was the youngest, the other two were older, but you can see in the footage, she's backing out of a parking spot and the kids are like running after her, like tapping her car. And all of a sudden she takes the car from reverse, throws it into park and, and goes forward. And the other two kids got out of the way, but the three-year-old did not. But not only did she run over him with her front right tire, she ran over him with her back right tire. So she didn't stop when she hit the kid. She didn't say, oh my God, I just hit my three-year-old, I have to get out and make sure he's okay. She kept going and ran over him again with her other tire. So obviously this was not an accident. Obviously she didn't have no idea that he was there. She was doing this on purpose. And of course now we have a neighbor who came forward and said, he's saddened by this and it's a tragedy, but he's not surprised because that family has had many issues with CPS before and they're neglectful, they're hardly ever home and the kids aren't taken care of. This past August, a woman stabbed her 12 year old son in his bed and then tried to take her own life. She survived, he did not. Again, this past month, a Florida man shot his wife her mother and their three-year-old daughter before turning the gun on himself. The three-year-old daughter had a twin, another girl who was found in the house unharmed. Nobody has any idea what his motive was, why he did it, why he shot one of his daughters and not the other. In the UK, Louise Porton was sentenced to life in prison after killing her three-year-old daughter and her 17-month-old daughter, about 10 days apart. This happened in early 2018 and they died from deliberate airway obstruction. Allegedly, she made Google searches for why did my three-year-old stop breathing and can you actually die if you have a blocked nose and cover your mouth with duct tape? 
The motive, her two young daughters, they got in the way of her social life. The day after the death of her three-year-old Lexi, she accepted something upwards of 30 friend requests and made dates with several men. And I'm sorry, I was incorrect. She did not kill her daughters 10 days apart. It was 18 days apart. So she killed Lexi first and then the younger one later. In 2015, a Florida woman stabbed her own father and her own six-year-old daughter because they were getting the way of a relationship with a new man she was dating. They were trying to ruin it and end it, she claimed. She only confessed to these murders after relatives forced her to report the two of them missing. This past July, officers responded to a call of a woman acting very strangely. She had taken her two sons, aged seven and 12, across the street to a field. The two were found unresponsive in an irrigation ditch. The 12 year old died from his injuries. The seven year old was initially listed as being in critical condition, but after a week of fighting for his life, he, he died as well. The family removed him from life support. This woman, her name was Sherry and her sons were named Jackson and Jacob. And in 2008, Sherry was found guilty for trying to drown her then 10 month old in a river. She brought the baby to a hospital and said she'd tried to drown him because he had demons in him and she obviously served some time. But after she got out of prison six years later, the custody of the child that she had tried to drown was returned to her. And if you look back historically past the last two or three years, there's, there's a case to me that sticks out more than others that to me was the first one I heard of in the news, very widespread, that talked about a woman killing her own children, and that was Andrea Yates. She drowned each of her five children, one by one, in a bathtub. This happened in 2001. The children's ages ranged from six months to seven years old, and everybody was shocked. Andrea was a well-respected nurse. She was well-respected in her community. Everybody said she was a super mom, essentially. She was a magnificent mother, but Andrea Yates had a lot of psychological issues that had gone uncared for. After the birth of her fourth child, she began suffering from some postpartum depression. She thought she heard voices inside her head. She said these voices were instructing her every day to kill her children. So instead of doing that, she tried to take her own life, but she survived even after this, even after seeing a psychiatrist and admitting to having these voices in her head and having these urges. She and her husband decided to have a fifth child against obviously medical advice. After this, things only got worse. Andrea began to believe that the television commercials were talking to her. She believed that inside of her and inside of her children, there were demons. She thought there was cameras in her house, like television cameras, monitoring how she was behaving as a mother. And she began to feel that her kids weren't developing intellectually, that there was demons inside of them and that they were gonna turn out badly and have bad lives because of her, her lack of parenting skills. So she decided it would be almost better for them if she took their lives and saved them from all of this. So she took her children's lives to save their souls, essentially. And we talked a little bit about it in the beginning of the video, why parents may do this. There's the um, altruistic filicide where like Andrea Yates, they think they're saving their children from a life of misery. There's the unwanted child filicide where essentially like the woman in the UK who killed her two young daughters because they were getting in the way of her social life. Essentially the, these kids are just not letting you live your best life. They're not allowing you to do the things you wanna do. So you figure if you get rid of them, then everything will be perfect. There's the child mistreatment filicide like Malachi Lawson, where the parent is just so abusive for such a long amount of time that this child ends up dying from these wounds or from the abuse. There's the spouse revenge filicide, obviously where one or the other parent will take their child's life in order to bring pain and agony upon the other parent, which is what a lot of people think happened in the case of Timothy Pitson, because Timothy's mother and father were having real issues. Timothy's mother had some um, psychological issues, and a lot of people think that she took Timothy and took his life to keep him from, from his father, knowing that it would hurt his father. But why is this important? Why are we talking about it today when it's a topic that so many people don't talk about and don't think about and don't wanna think about? Most of us could never imagine hurting a child, much less our own child. So why are there so many incidences of people who do? The real issue is no matter what the motive or the reason of why this happens, there are warning signs and there's red flags 
that medical health professionals and people who are close to the families or the parents of the children, people in the community, neighbors, other family members, they can look for these warning signs and these red flags. But even if we see them, even if we report it to CPS, there's a good chance that nothing will happen and we can't just stroll in vigilante style like Spider-Man on a web and take these children out of the house. We have to allow the legal system to go about it in a way that is legal and which is you know, a process which takes some time and they need all sorts of proof and it pretty much needs to be you know, without a doubt that this is what's happening before a child will be removed from a home. The child protective system is incredibly flawed and a lot of the time, even if a child is removed from their parents' care or custody, it's, not, it's only gonna be a matter of time before they're pulled right back into the hands of the people who hurt them. Look at the case of Josh Powell, which was a case that we just talked about last month, the Susan Powell and Josh Powell case. The system was legitimately considering giving Josh Powell overnight visits with his sons. Knowing how messed up he was in his head after having a psychological assessment, knowing that he probably killed their mother, they were still considering doing it. Like it was about to happen. So you just have to question what's going on. What's happening? Why is the system so flawed and how can it be fixed? The Australian Institute of Criminology published a report at the beginning of 2019 that stated at least one child in Australia is killed by a parent each fortnight. In 2017, CNN published an article titled, A Parent Killing a Child Happens More Often Than We Think. In this article, I read that between the years of 1967 and 2007, there were roughly 500 filicide cases a year in the US. A year, not between those years, that's the amount, 500 a year. Almost 72% of these involved children under the age of six and one third of the victims were a year old or younger. 40% of the parents who committed the filicide were mothers and 57% were fathers. But author Cheryl Meyer says that it's probable that a mother or father kills a child somewhere in the US every three days. So this is basically saying, okay, these are the cases we know about, but what about all the cases where the mother or father goes in and says, oh, the baby never woke up. And they say it's like sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. They can, they can apply that to a multitude of things that happen when children die, especially within the first year of their life. But how do we know that it wasn't due to some kind of abuse from the parent? All the children who are reported missing, and we know that there are a lot, how do we know that something didn't happen to them at the hands of their parents and the body was just hidden. And that's happened and been discovered to be the case multiple times. The worst part is a lot of these kids who end up being killed by their parents, they've been through the CPS system or CPS has come to their home, but so many of them have never been on the radar of CPS. So what's happening? And because you have so many implications, you have marital stress, you have psychological issues, you have just being a parent is stressful and you're tired and you're stressed out and sometimes you just wanna be left alone. Because we as a society don't want to broadcast that we're feeling this way. We don't wanna broadcast that we're having issues with our husband and we're going through you know, a dispute about who's going to have custody of our children. We don't want to discuss with the public that we are stressed out that we are exhausted and that sometimes we feel like locking ourselves in a bathroom and letting our children cry it out. We don't want to discuss with the public that we might have some psychological issues. Many women who suffer from postpartum depression after having a child, they don't discuss it not with their husbands, not with their family, not with their friends, not with the doctor because it's embarrassing and it shouldn't be embarrassing because it's nothing you can control. It's chemical and it's not a thing that you chose to have, but women are embarrassed because we think that we're meant to be mothers and we're meant to, to birth children and we should be happy about having this new child and we shouldn't be depressed and we shouldn't be sad and we shouldn't be thinking that we hate our lives. So some women, the majority of women I think who suffer with postpartum depression, they don't want to broadcast that. So when we have children and we have new babies, we're posting on Instagram and Facebook, look at my cute new baby and his cute little outfit. We're not posting today, I literally couldn't even anymore. And I cried in my bathtub for three hours. We're not posting that stuff because we don't want to broadcast. We're having a hard time. 
So you have all these issues behind closed doors that people don't talk about. Then you also have the issue of just plain old child abuse and children who are abused like that on a regular basis, they are too afraid to talk. They're too afraid to tell anybody what's happening because they're scared that the abuse will continue and then nobody will be able to help them because that's what their parents tell them because the parents who are abusive are also emotionally, mentally abusive and they threaten the children and they threaten their kids and they say, if you tell anybody, it's gonna get worse and nobody's gonna help you because I'm your parent and I can do whatever I want to you. So you have all of these issues, all of these really sad and hard to deal with issues that are hidden behind closed doors and then nobody is broadcasting. So we really need to make people, especially the people who are struggling with psychological issues and some mental health issues after having kids or while being parents, that they should be encouraged and feel safe to talk about it with a friend, a group maybe, for other women and other mothers who have had children and are struggling with it. There's Facebook groups for that. There's a million Facebook groups for mothers who are support systems for each other after giving birth and struggling with it. We need to encourage people to seek out these methods of coping so that they don't go forward and, and end up hurting themselves or their children because of them. For a network of social workers who are underpaid, understaffed, overworked, you'll have this thing where children and families fall through the cracks. And I don't think it's the social workers fault. I think they, they want to do as much as they can, but they're also suffering with some psychological issues because of the things that they see and deal with every day and the families that they're trying to help, but they only have so much that they can do. So they have to go home sometimes knowing that they're leaving a child in the custody of somebody who might hurt them. They have to face that and deal with that and go through that every day. So we need to be really focusing on and stressing the importance of psychological help, not only for the families and the children who may be suffering with these issues, but for the social workers who are trying to help these people because the more mentally healthy you are, the better and more logically you'll be able to see a situation and you can actually come up with solutions instead of feeling trapped and instead of feeling powerless. And I think that's how a lot of these social workers end up feeling is trapped and powerless. I know something's going on here, but I have to go through all of these methods and I have to go through all of these other avenues and um, efforts before I can remove this child from a house where I think that he's being harmed in. And that can be frustrating. And that is why I ended up not going into social work because I did an, an internship and I did some work at a children's hospital. I did some volunteer uh, work at a, a hotline for people who were considering taking their own lives. And it, it really affected my mental health because I wanted to help but I couldn't. And eventually you almost become numb to it and you just start going through the motions in order to save your own brain from exploding. So obviously these are issues. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what the heck you think is going on and how you think we as a society might be able to help or to stop it or to bring awareness to it and shine a light on it because it's very, very important. And I'm gonna put some numbers in the description box. If you do know of a child who is with a family who may be abusing them or there's some signs for you, you should call. If there's nothing going on, if the child's fine, that will be discovered. Nobody will ever know that it was you. You don't need to feel afraid that your neighbor's going to hate you or your sister-in-law's going to hate you, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And I've said that a million times and by no way am I encouraging people or advocating people to get into people's lives and sneak in and just start reporting. Like if you see, you know, your brother spank his kid, don't be like, oh my God, I'm calling Child Protective Services. This is horrible. That's not the kind of abuse I'm talking about. People want to discipline their children in their own way. Personally, I don't believe in spanking, but um, I was spanked. <laughs> My mother beat me with a wooden spoon a couple of times. I didn't feel that was child abuse. I know my mother loves me and she never left like any marks or anything, probably so she couldn't get in trouble. But what I'm saying is it, it's different. People are, are, are from different cultures and from different times and they come from different families. So you can't just assume that, you know, everyone who's getting spanked is being abused. What I am saying is if you see that a child is, for instance, searching through your garbage for food because he's not getting fed at home, that's when you need to call. If you see that a child has burns or bruises all over him regularly, if he seems afraid, if he seems to be not dressed properly or not cleaned, those are the signs that somebody, that a child is being neglected or abused. So, you know, give a call in to your local CPS agency 
and, and that's, that's what we can do for now. Thank you guys so much for being here. I know this was a hard one and I know it wasn't um, lighthearted as sometimes my coffee and crime times can be, but once again, it's incredibly important. And if every one of you tell only one other person about the stories that I just told you about, about the victims that we so often forget because you know, they get, they get brushed under the rug. You can look and say 500 deaths a year, that's not much. I mean, look how many people are killed and you're just run of the mill murders. But that's 500 children, 500 innocent children who did literally nothing to deserve it. And they need to be remembered and they need to be respected. So if every one of you tells only one other person, your husband, your mother, anybody, if you tell them about this and you tell them that this is a real thing and you let them know what the warning signs could and should be, and what they can do if they, they see that, see something, say something. Thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind and stay beautiful. And I'll see you soon. Bye. I once again want to thank our sponsor, Big Fish Casino, for giving me the opportunity to talk about such a sensitive and important topic on YouTube. Make sure you check the description box to get your 500,000 chips free. I feel in my bones Like a blaze of fire dancing in the cold Oh, at the rhythm of the sun Well, I was wide awake until the dawn upon her face And the echoes of our song as it hummed along Saying everything is gonna work out fine And all the hopes we have were falling